right now. We're gonna go to our first slide and I'm gonna start my video. Jim Cunningham will be joining as well. And you can see me on hopefully the top right of the screen or something like that. So our presenta presentation today is going to be on IRAs and how to pass IRAs to your beneficiaries, to your heirs, whoever it is you have in mind, as well as traps and common errors that are associated with them. Now today's presentation, I have to give you our disclaimer, it is not going to be legal advice. Today's presentation is educational advice only. I haven't seen your unique situation. Jim Cunningham hasn't seen your unique situation. So that's why it is not legal advice. Everything we talk about today, is purely for your educational purposes only. Now I will, let's see, I got a note from Jim. I did let him start the video. Okay, Jim asking me to start his video for him. I'm gonna do it. All right, hello Jim. Hey, how you doing Connor? Good, okay. So today's presentation, like I said, 45 minutes. Uh, you can type in questions and answers throughout the presentation. We may answer them as we go through, but either way, we will offer questions and answers at the end of today's presentation. All right, so let's jump right into it. So Cunningham Legal, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Cunningham Legal? Yeah, so uh, I've been in practice 25 years and kind of started when I was uh, younger than Connor. And uh, we've grown it to seven attorneys and about 23 other staff people and offices in Southern and Northern California. And uh, I really enjoy meeting with the old clients, not old necessarily in age, but the ones that I met with maybe 20 years ago or so. It's, all, it's always nice to see them come back in and um, kind of check in with them, see how their, their families have developed, kids, grandkids, the whole thing. So I'm blessed to work with, uh, with just a great group of people. Great. I have been practicing for four years, so not quite 25 years, but uh, four years is still something, right? That's pretty uh, good, my, yeah. My background is in taxation. I have my tax LLM from Loyola Law School. Both Jim and I, we went to the same law school. We went to Whittier Law School at a, a different time. Though. But either way, uh, like I said, today's presentation is gonna be somewhat tax focused because IRAs, as you probably know, if you have a traditional IRA, when you pull money out of that IRA, you're gonna pay income tax. And for our clients out there that are taking distributions from their IRAs, that tax bracket analysis is a real important part of their life. And that's what we're gonna to discuss today, passing those, uh, those, those IRAs to different heirs. Now, I do want to say our office, Cunningham Legal, for those who are joining us for the first time, we have several offices throughout California, both Northern and Southern California. I work primarily out of the Pasadena office, and you can see our attorneys here. We have seven of us, and of course, due to a lot of people who still want to utilize social distancing, we offer Zoom appointments throughout the entire world. All right, so a lot of you who are joining us have heard of the SECURE Act. I'm gonna go over it one more time. The SECURE Act, that passed last December. And what it did was it changed the most common retirement plan. So it changed IRAs and Roth IRAs, 401Ks and 403Bs, any qualified retirement plan was essentially changed. Now, the goal of these changes were to increase revenue via taxation for the federal government. And then also they wanted to make sure that people, citizens, participants in these plans were able to save for retirement. So the SECURE Act did two big things. Number one was it changed the year that somebody takes a required minimum distribution from age 70 and a half to age 72. So now if you have a traditional IRA, when you turn 72, you have to pull money out a little bit every year. The rest of it continues to grow tax-free, however. And then also the way that these accounts are inherited changed. Now for years, when somebody inherited an IRA, they could grow that money over their lifetime. Jim, why don't you talk about the changes? The yeah, so here's, here's uh, and I made, and on the prior slide, I, there was, you saw, you might've seen something called the 10th year rule. Now, what the 10th year rule is, that I, that's a word or a phrase I made up because it is not stretched out over 10 years. So what's going on here? It used to be in the night, before the 1980s, if you inherited an IRA, 
there was no minimum distribution. So what we're not talking about is while you're working and contributing to your 401k and your IRA, and then when you turn 70 and a half or now 72, you have to start taking out a minimum distribution based on age, okay? So you have to take out a certain percentage of your account every year based upon your age at the end of the year. So someone who turns 75 takes out slightly more than someone who turns 74 in a given year. And that's after you retire. And so for those of you who have already retired and are taking minimum distributions, that's important to note that a Roth, there is no minimum distribution requirement while you're alive. And then certainly if you're continuing to work with a 401k and over 70 and a half or over 72, you're not taking a minimum distribution um, either. So uh, very important to understand that, that the laws really did change last December. And it used to be that if a 50-year-old inherited an IRA, they didn't wait till, so they inherit an IRA from mom or dad or whomever. They didn't wait until 70 or now 72 to take out a minimum distribution, but they had to start taking out a minimum distribution the year after the person who owned the IRA, the year after that person's death. So a 50-year-old, if somebody died in, in, uh, in 2018, they would have to take out by December 31 of 2019 a certain amount of money based on age. And again, the older you are, the higher the percentage came out. Well, what happened in December of last year is that all went away for, on a general rule, and there's some exceptions, but um, sort of the, the, the big picture is that system, when you inherit an IRA and you take out a little bit every year at age 50, for example, you have to, um, the, the new rule is you don't have to take anything out for 10 years. And then in the 10th year following death by December 31, so a person, a person dies in 2020, all of the money has to come out by December 31 of 2030. So a 50-year-old who inherits an IRA in 2020 is now under a set of rules that says no minimum distributions occur for a full 10 years. And then in, in 2030, by December 31, all of the money has to come out of the IRA. And so what that does is that um, spreads out those, uh, and you can take money before that, but the minimum distribution, the amount you must take out, is in the 10th year. And that's actually 11 tax years, and that's kind of what we're, I think we're talking about on this slide, um, I think in, in a subsequent slide, but that offers some, some tax planning opportunities. So do you want to talk about the, well, yeah. By the way, a designated beneficiary in order to get that 10-year time period, not only do you have to be a beneficiary, right, but you have to be something called a designated beneficiary. And that has a very specific meaning under the law. It means that you've complied with uh, some kind of archaic, little-known rules within a certain period of time. If you don't qualify as a designated beneficiary, so we're talking about the person who inherits the money, everyone's a beneficiary. If you inherit money, you're a beneficiary. Bene means good, right? In Latin, you get the goods. The beneficiary gets the good stuff. They get the money. But to be a designated beneficiary, that permits you to stretch it out over 10 years. If you blow it and you don't follow the rules, you are not a designated beneficiary. And if you're not a designated beneficiary, all the money must come out in substantially equal payments over five years. Let me say that again. All of the money must come out in substantially equal payments over five years. So if it's a $100,000 account, it's 20,000, 20,000, 20,000, 20,000. That's a lot different than if someone inherits a $100,000 account, $100, account and they don't have to make any distribution or take any minimum distribution for 10 years. So in, under the five-year rule, you have to pay taxes sooner so you have less time to have that money invested in a tax-deferred account. Now, um, there's something, a super class, we'll call them, of eligible designated beneficiaries. These are people who are um, less than 10 years younger, so 10 years younger or older. Uh, minor, minor children, so this would be someone dies and they leave minor children, not minor grandchildren, but minor children. And in California, that's actually up to age 26 if they're a full-time college student. And then people who are disabled or chronically ill. Chronically ill is actually defined in the Internal Revenue Code. You're basically unable to work, but you're not necessarily disabled within the meaning of the Social Security Disability Act. 
Those people are under, under the old set of rules, which is age dependent, meaning if a 50 year old who is disabled inherits an IRA, they don't have to take it out in, uh, by the 10th year, but they have to take money out the year following death based on their age. So it's not all in 10 years, but it's maybe 3% the first year, 3.1% the next year, 3.3% the following year. So it's a little bit, but you know, those are frankly exceptions kind of outside of the scope of this overarching uh, theme, which is uh, what we're talking about here. I don't want to say they're normal people who inherit, but these are people past the age of majority without a disability or chronically ill, so not an exception. So this is going to be the general rule going forward. Um, these rules have really changed, and it's very important, and I'm so glad you're attending uh, here today. This is very important for you to understand because there's a lot at stake. So a question comes in uh, from Walter. My grandson is five years old right now. I am 79. Do I understand you correctly? He will not qualify as an eligible designated beneficiary. The answer is yes. Unfortunately, he will not. That's just, uh, so he's under the 10th year rule. And here's why, if you want to leave an IRA to a five-year-old grandson, and Walter, let's say you, you're 79, you set this plan up, and you pass away. And your grandson is five when he inherits. You should consider having a plan for this IRA, because all that money has to come out when your grandson's 15, or maybe 16. Uh, but all that money comes out in a lump, but 16-year-olds can't essentially possess more than $5,000 in California. If you have more than 5,000, you need to start a guardianship. So what would end up happening is your grandson would have to take all that money out at age 15, which means somebody would have to think about that ahead of time, get to the courthouse, start a guardianship, even though the, grand, the, child, the grandchild has parents, right? You would have to start a guardianship of the estate in order to frankly do the paperwork to receive that minimum distribution uh, for a 15 year old. And if you don't make your minimum distribution, it is a 50% penalty. So you have to take that money. And if you don't get to court fast enough, it's a real problem. So if you're leaving IRA money to grandkids, you need to have a plan for that money. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here. And so Walter added on the question for a Roth. We will discuss Roth IRAs a little bit later today, but you are able to set up a distribution plan for a minor child uh, that comes from a Roth IRA. And we'll talk about how that works as we go through. So let's go on to the next slide. And next slide, we're going to talk about IRA trust themselves. So why does somebody set up an IRA trust? So I'm just going to go over. What, now, what pro talk about what problem it solves, Connor. What problem does the IRA trust solve? I, I always say three problems. Number one is it, it forces the beneficiaries to think about taxation. A lot of people, when they inherit, the last thing that's on their mind is taxes. They want their money. And we're going to talk about that as we go through. IRA trust, it forces them on a yearly basis over those 11 years to make sure before they pull out money that they know what the tax consequences are. IRA trust also provides asset protection. And so asset protection, the big one's going to be from divorce. A lot of our clients, like I always tell my own clients, like I tell Jim, a lot of my clients, their biggest asset are their retirement accounts. It's worth more than the equity in their house. And it's important that in case something happens to a beneficiary, as they inherit, like they're being sued or they go through a divorce, that there is a plan in place that provides them with asset protection so that at least some of the money, if not all the money, can be secure from creditors. Now, my final point that we will get to is IRA trust, they allow a grantor to control their money inside the IRA they started through the use of contingent beneficiaries. And we're going to hit on all three of those, but let's start on the first one, the tax part of it, or excuse me, the asset protection part of it. So asset protection. Now I'm going to give an example. We have a client who in the past named their daughter as beneficiary on their IRA. They had one daughter and she inherited the whole thing. And as they passed away, she was going through a divorce. And there is no real estate plan there for asset protection when you name somebody as beneficiary on your IRA. You pass away and it's part of the child's estate. And so, of course, that IRA influences her divorce outcome. It can change spousal support obligations. It can change child support obligations. It can do everything. And so, with a trust, if there would have been a trust in place, an IRA trust, the daughter, she would not have to have to serve as trustee. 
she could have served as trustee if it was a time of peace, but because there's this litigation here, this divorce, she could have resigned as trustee and allowed a trust protector to name a new trustee, an independent party, some type of fiduciary or someone independent. And the way these trusts are set up is that only the minimum amount of money comes out of the trust, enough for support, for healthcare, for maintenance, but not enough to come out to satisfy big judgments. And so there is asset protection there. And so for a lot of people that have most of their money or a huge, huge plurality of their money inside an IRA, they benefit from adding asset protection to that IRA. Yeah, it's important to note, by the way, this is a U.S. Supreme Court case in 2014. There is zero asset protection. This is federal law. This is Supreme Court ruling nine to zero. Nine to zero, no creditor protection for an IRA. So if I inherit an IRA, uh, let's say my parents die and they, they leave me a $100,000 IRA, and, that, and I say, you know, uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't set up a plan or whatever. And, and I inherit this IRA and I'm waiting 10 years because I want to delay the taxes, right? Because if I take out that $100,000 IRA, I have to pay taxes on that. And that might be 50,000 in taxes. Well, I'd rather leave that 50,000 that I would otherwise pay in taxes to continue to grow and build because the outcome is better than if I just take all the money out. The problem is that is totally exposed to creditors while I'm alive. And even more importantly, there is a big question mark on who inherits the inherited IRA, and we're going to get to that. And that's another reason to take control of your estate, uh, take control of your IRA, and leave it to an IRA inheritance trust. All right, that's a great transition. So that's another part of this as well. So if you name your child or your children as beneficiary on your IRA, and then everything goes to plan, you pass away, your child takes that money, and they even do some tax planning by themselves without this IRA in place, Still, if your child lives in a community property state like California, they're going to essentially have to name their spouse as their beneficiary on the inherited IRA if they pass away. And that happens periodically. Somebody passes away and there's still money inside the IRA. Now, pretty much all of my clients, if their child died with money left in that IRA, they would not want that money to go to their spouse. They'd want the money to stay in the family, to go to their grandchildren. And that's what the IRA Trust allows us to do, to name grandkids and other children as contingent beneficiaries. And also something to be mindful of is people, and we, we say this, um, in, we, we use this term internally, which is sometimes people die out of order. And what that means is typically, you know, the grandparents pass away first, then the parents, then the children. Well, sometimes the children pass away uh, before their parents uh, do. And so then money's going to grandkids. So where you have grandparent, uh, child, grandchild, sometimes the children die first. And sometimes those children will pass away when the person who owns the IRA does not have capacity to do planning. So there is an 80% probability you will have a period of incapacity before death. 80%. Death is 100% certainty, right? Uh, it was, so I've been told. And... Uh, but you're going to have an 80% probability of some form of incapacity before death. So we see frequently kids dying before their parents, and then it's too late to do planning. And now you have maybe a minor inheriting an IRA uh, or somebody inheriting an IRA who's going to be very irresponsible with it and just yank the money out and not pay the taxes. And if any money goes to a minor in these trusts or somebody even at a young age, you know, below the age of 25 or 30, the IRA trust allows that money to be managed by somebody that you name as opposed to a court until that young person turns a certain age. So it gives you a plan just in case money does end up going to a minor or if you plan on giving money to a minor. All right, so let's go to our third part of this, which is gonna be the tax bracket arbitrage. And that's gonna be making a plan for taxes. And this is gonna be the most technical part of this, but I think it's pretty simple to understand. Now imagine if you leave $500,000 to your child, $500,000. Now they have a few choices. They inherit, okay? They inherit without an IRA trust. And they can take all their money in year one. But what's going to happen if they take it in year one? They're going to pay taxes. And so let's say that you get somebody who says, oh, I've had retirement plans my whole life. And I know that I'm gonna take my money out at the last second possible. I'm gonna do it in the last year, year 10, 11, whatever you wanna call it. Well, what's gonna happen then? It's gonna grow and it's gonna be hopefully higher than $500,000, maybe closer to a million dollars. And they're just going to pay taxes in that year. 
So I have my little charts here where we can talk about taxation. So let, let's, uh, let's see, can you see my mouse? Can you see my mouse, Jim, by chance? I can see your mouse, yes. So I'm looking at the, uh, the tax brackets here for, we'll, we'll go with a single person. So what happens is, let's say you have your, your default single person in California, I'll just be generous and we'll say they make $100,000 a year. And if they make $100,000 a year, they'll be at that 24% tax bracket. Well, if they inherit $500,000, they're gonna get bumped up potentially to this 37% rate. Now that's if they're single. Now, if they're married, it's very similar. Let's say they're in this 22% bracket. If they inherit $500,000 in that final year 10 or in year one, they're gonna be in a 35% bracket. And that goes for if they take it all in year 10 as well. And it's not just federal taxes you have to worry about. You have California as well. So California is going to take their hit and you can see your single people here, you know, maybe you have a child that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. They're paying 9.3% to California. Well, if they inherit another 500,000, they're going to get bumped up to 12.3%. Yeah. Solid. And it's, it's super, and folks, it's very important. I'm not sure if you can see this. I've got to make it a little bit bigger here so I can see it. Um, very important. I want you to look at the tax bracket for single uh, payers is it hits 10% at 275,000 in income. Now, not many people make 275,000 in income, but, but some do. It's very important to understand. When money comes out of an IRA, it is added to the recipient's income for that year. And so, you know, a $500,000 IRA, you know, when I was Connor's age and I was practicing and a client came in with a $500,000 IRA, I was kind of like, wow, that's a lot of money. You don't see too many IRAs of 500,000. Well, now many of our clients have IRAs that are far in excess of a million dollars because they've saved, uh, they've gotten older, they've been financially disciplined. Uh, they've done a lot of good things to create wealth in their estate. And when you look at this tax rate, and this is just the state tax rate of 10.3%, a $275,000 IRA is not that big of an IRA, honestly, folks. And if you inherit a million dollar IRA or a $500,000 IRA, you're pushed up into the high tax brackets where the rate that you're paying on much of that money, on much of that money that, that you're pulling out of an IRA is taxed for Californians at close to 50%. So what you can do is you can say, look, if you inherit a million dollar IRA, just as, a, as an estimate, you're gonna be paying about 500,000 in tax and about a hundred odd thousand of that is gonna be 120,000 or so is gonna be state income tax. And there's a really cool planning technique to at least defer the state income tax that we're going to be talking about. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, 50.3%. And every year, people's income change. Every year, no one makes the same amount of money, or generally people don't make the same amount of money. It changes. And even if that does stay the same, these tax brackets change all the time. There are quite a few people in this country and in the government that want these tax brackets to change. And so you might see that. And so it does require thought every year to come up with a good analysis regarding how much money you should take out of that IRA to make sure you don't pay too much tax. And while still you wanna leave money in the IRA so it can continue to grow tax-free. So you have to balance those options year after year if you inherit. Yeah, so to put this into context, Assume someone's passed away and someone has inherited an IRA. Okay, so what we're talking about is after somebody's died, so this is not your IRA that you're putting money into, but after someone dies, boom, you have a $500,000 IRA. There it's sitting in an account you inherited in 2020. The first question is, should you take anything out in 2020? Well, if this year is a year where you're not making that much money and you're in a lower tax bracket, you're going to want to potentially look at taking out some of that money, some you know, depending on the size, maybe all of it, who knows. But look at taking out some of it. And typically when we talk about tax bracket management, tax bracket arbitrage, okay, what we're talking about is you may want to do, uh, you may want to pull some money out that puts you up just below the next tax bracket, right? So it doesn't push you into a higher tax rate. This also applies, we'll talk in a, in a couple of minutes about Roth conversions. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if you have a, a million dollar IRA and you're 70, you say, well, I'm going to live till I'm just making this up. I'm going to live till I'm 90. That's 20 years. You may want to think about doing a Roth conversion, not all at once, but you may want to think about doing a Roth conversion of part of your IRA. And for, you know, example, 50,000 this year, right? So you might say, you know, I'll take 50,000. I'll pay some tax knowing that next year 
that 50,000 that I've converted to a Roth, I don't have a minimum distribution on that, okay? So I don't have a minimum distribution. And, and this year is actually the year that you really should think about Roth conversions because there is no minimum distribution. I, we should mention that on any retirement account at all this year, you cannot use minimum distributions to convert to a Roth. It has to be in excess of a minimum distribution. And we will go over Roth really soon, but I do want to hit on one more point, which is going to be the bonus point of reducing state tax. Now, this doesn't apply to many of our clients, but it certainly applies to quite a few. So if you have a traditional IRA and you utilize an IRA trust to be used as a conduit accumulation trust to go to your children, you can name a Nevada successor trustee. And as long as the money is just distributed to the trust as opposed to your child, is if your child lives in California, still they will not pay state income tax. So a lot of our beneficiaries, they're not sure if they're going to retire in California. Some of them think they're gonna to go to a different state altogether or any state, any state essentially has less state income tax in California. <laughs> any state has less tax, with the exception of New York City. <laughs> New York City, yeah, if you live in the city, you're higher. City and state, I think it's higher. City and state combined. Uh, so that being said, a lot of our clients, their kids, they might move out of state and it might make sense to hold money in trust and then defer that state income tax to a different day. Now, this doesn't work for the majority of our clients, but it's worth examining. And that's why we do a client interviews. That's why we do consultations to figure out if that's something that works for you. All right. So now let's go on to the big part of it, the part that, uh, that I love and the part I think Jim likes too which is gonna be Roth IRAs. So just a refresher for those who aren't familiar with Roth, they only came out 20 years ago. A Roth IRA, when you put after-tax dollars in a Roth account, the growth is tax-free, of course, provided you take it out past age 59 and a half. There are no RMDs. A lot of my clients hate taking RMDs. They hate being forced to take out $50,000, $100,000 a year. With the Roth, you can leave it in there until whatever age you want. Now, I'm not telling you to only have a Roth IRA. I'm not advising that to anybody. I'm not educating that, if you want to call it that for the video. But I think it's important to consider at least putting some of your money in a Roth because that money can be typically the last money touched. And it's so much easier to inherit than a regular IRA. If that money goes to your kids, they don't take it out in year one. They don't have to play that tax bracket management game, arbitrage game every single year because the distributions are tax-free. They can generally wait until year 10, until the money is worth the most and pull it out all in year 10. And they can leave it in an IRA trust and have asset protection for the rest of their life, or they can distribute it. Either way, it's going to be tax-free. And yeah, this is... And just, I would just say, this is very important to understand. And, and, and many of my clients will say, well, Jim... Uh, why would they leave it in a Roth after they inherit it? Because they can take all the money out tax-free. Here's the deal. If you inherit a Roth, you are going to want to give very serious consideration to leaving that money in for as long as possible. And here's why. When you inherit a Roth IRA, let's say you inherit a $500,000 Roth IRA, and that grows in 10 years to a million dollars. That growth of 500,000, if you wait that 10 years to take the money out in that 10th year, that whole million dollars comes out tax-free. That is a really, really big deal. So let me say that again. You wanna leave your Roth IRAs in for as long as you can. So if, if, some, if someone has a Roth IRA and they leave it to you, you're gonna wanna have that Roth IRA stay in that Roth account for that full 10 years, right up to December 31 of, of that particular year because all those gains, all that income, all those dividends, all those capital gains, you're never gonna pay tax on that. Not, you're not gonna pay state income tax, you're not gonna pay federal income tax. It is a wonderful wealth uh, generating uh, strategy. I think a perfect estate plan for retirement accounts would be in year 10, the beneficiary places it in the IRA trust and for the rest of their life, they just take the income from the IRA trust. Mm -hmm. and the principal sits there for asset protection reasons and they just get that income every year. So really the Roth, I, I see a lot of clients that don't utilize Roth because like I said, they only came around in the late nineties and there are some opponents of Roths. There's some people that say, I've heard it before, we, we work with them, that say, why would I pay anything to the IRS when I could just do it later? I guess if that's the way you feel, that's the way you feel. But I, I'm not saying only do a Roth. I'm saying consider doing a Roth in addition to your traditional. 
Now, well, you- and, and for clarity's sake, you can start with a Roth. So in our law firm, and Connor brought this to my attention, he says, hey, Jim, we because sh- we have, by the way, we've kept people since COVID broke. We haven't let anyone go. We've kept people employed. We've not cut anyone's pay, uh, not their base pay. Um, we have, we provide a 401k in our law firm. We provide health care. So we want to take care of our, of our staff so they can take care of our clients. One of the things that Connor brought to my attention is he says, Jim, you should do a Roth 401k. You should have that as an option. So we have that as an option in our own law firm. So we're drinking from the well. Our employees can contribute to a Roth 401k, which is, it's like a Roth IRA, but you, you put after tax money in it. And it's, it's really important to, to understand that, um, there is some resistance in, um, we, we, it's mostly from financial advisors, and I'm gonna say this in the nicest way I can. Many financial advisors, to your point, Connor, what they'll say is, you should never pay tax before you have to. I think that's a, a judgment call. I think in the broader, uh, if you're looking at a very broad, um, high level view of your estate, and, and I'll go back to Walter's point, he says, I've got a five-year-old grandson. Well, you know what? For a five-year-old grandson, if I had a five-year-old grandson and I was going to leave him money, I might do a Roth conversion because it is such a wealth generator for that five-year-old. Um, it's really unbelievable. And, and the amount you pay, yes, you might pay some in tax, uh, but you might not. It just depends. You know, it depends on, on where you're at, on your taxable income and your brackets. Yeah, Walter said he is leaving the Roth to his grandchild, so that, that is a decent plan. I mean, yeah, you pay the tax now, and uh, no matter what the tax brackets might change to one day, still it's going to be already paid and walter said that's exactly what i'm doing through the chatbot all right so roth conversions um this is a good year to do a roth conversion assuming that you're taking the rmd you're over the age of 72 because in most years you have to take your rmd so maybe that's fifty thousand bucks and then you you can't convert any of that anything above that you can convert. So if you want to take out extra money and pay tax, you can do so. Well, this year there is no RMD. There might not be an RMD next year either. So these years you can take out a little bit of money or whatever money you like, and you can pay the tax on it. And then you can put it inside one of these Roth accounts. So if you're 70 and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm 70 or 72. uh, I don't want to do any more retirement planning. Just keep in mind, you pay the tax on this income now, and you put that money in a Roth and that money might be there for the next 20 years or until you're whatever it is, 90, hundred. And all that gain will be tax free. You'll never have to take it out if you don't want to. And if you do, it's all tax free. And if it goes to your beneficiaries, it will be tax free for them as well. All right. So uh, let's shift gears here. I'm going to talk now about, uh, the, the, I guess, the end of this, which is going to be the IRA part, which is leaving your IRA to a human beneficiary is not a plan. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably better than going to probate, I'll tell you that. But still, if you leave your IRA to your beneficiaries, just human beneficiaries, you might have these issues that we've talked about down the road. Uh, someone says, can you do Roth conversions without earned income? Yes, you can yeah. do Roth conversions without earned income. It used yeah. to be pre-Secure Act, and I probably should have touched on this, you couldn't start a Roth without earned income. That might actually be the same rule. To start a Roth, to, to really do any retirement account, you have to generally have earned, in, earned income, I believe. But conversions, you can still do. And that is a financial advisor can help you with that as well. All right. So like I said, having a human beneficiary isn't really necessarily a plan. It's important to think these things through, especially if you have a lot of money inside your IRA. It's important that you protect it. Now, if you have an IRA trust pre-Secure Act, so pre-January 2020, it's important to have it reviewed to make sure it is up to date. Yeah. And let's, so I, we've written, oh man, I don't even know how many hundreds and hundreds of IRA trust, uh, IRA legacy trust over the, the last few years. And it used to be the default was something called a conduit trust. And all that means is whatever minimum distribution comes out, the trustee shall distribute shall distribute that minimum distribution to the beneficiary. Now, there were some reasons uh, to do that that we're not going to kind of outside of the scope of today, but that was, that was essentially the default. And the exception was to do something called an accumulation trust, which is the money comes out of the IRA, but it stays in the trust. So you can think of this IRA trust as a bucket and there's a can of Coke, right, inside of the bucket. 
and the can of Coke is the IRA. And so what you do is you pour the can of Coke out into the bucket, but the Coke is still had, held by the bucket, right? So this is kind of a, I don't know, very simple analogy, basic. But the idea is you do not distribute to the beneficiary the proceeds from the IRA account, but they stay in the trust. That's an accumulation trust. The trustee has discretion to give that minimum distribution to the beneficiary or withhold the minimum distribution. That is now the default going forward. So they've kind of flipped the switch and you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, you know, left is right and right is left now. Um, so we've kind of done a, a 180 on our planning. So if you have an existing trust, please uh, check in with us. Uh, you can call us to schedule a time to go over it uh, with you uh, on the phone or in person or by Zoom. But very, very important that you look at that. Something else I want to touch on. Uh, and I, I'm not sure, is this on the slide about people aren't going to, they're going to blow by the, the September 30th date? Um, no, I, that, that's the five thing you talked about earlier. Okay, so here's the deal. In order to qualify as a designated beneficiary, and this is super important, guys. This is something that I would say on the top five things you need to know about estate planning. I mean, this is way up there. If you inherit an IRA by September 30th of the year following death, by September 30th of the year following death of the person who owns the IRA, you have to communicate to the institution the identity of the beneficiary. Now, this may sound um, like, what are you talking about? The way you set up an IRA, you, you set up an account and you sign something called a subscription agreement or a beneficiary designation or some type of legal document. And typically, it's, you know, if it's with XYZ company, it's XYZ form. And in this form, it says, you know, Jim Cunningham, who do you want to designate as your beneficiary? Well, I'll designate my wife. For, and it might be like spouse might be the first box that's checked, right? Uh, and then another box might be my descendants, okay, my children. That's an example of not having a name on a beneficiary designation, okay? You can identify people who are your, your, your you can identify them by their relationship to you, not by name. So what I mean by that is, you, yes, you can write in a name, but if that person's dead, in order to be a designated beneficiary, and this is really important, you have to be a human being with a heartbeat, okay? And you have to have, be a human being and alive. Your heart has to be beating. Otherwise, you're not a designated beneficiary. So it's very important that that information is communicated to the custodian by September 30th. If the information is not communicated to the custodian by September 30th, then what happens? Well, you're under the five-year rule. You're in the penalty box. So the worst thing, and I'm afraid this is going to happen, people are going to die. They're going to kind of do it on, you know, go on the uh, do-it-yourself stuff and say, oh, there's a 10-year rule. I don't have to do anything for 10 years. Wrong. That's 100% wrong. You still have to become a designated beneficiary. There's still stuff to do. And if you don't do it, all the money has to come out in five years. Well, what if it doesn't come out in five years? It's a 50% penalty. Okay, so this is really serious business, folks. The penalties are huge. Anita has a question. Can I convert a 401k to a Roth IRA? The answer is yes, and that's something we can certainly direct you to the right people uh, to make sure that they do it appropriately. Okay, and um, I think you make great points. I do want to stress, though, when for our clients here that have set up an IRA trust in the past, when we set up IRA trust, we provide that notice to the person who has the IRA. As soon as the trust is set up, we even give them a copy of the trust so that we satisfy that September 30th deadline while our client is still living. So that's a big part as well. Now, you know, otherwise, if people just inherit these things straight up, they will have to do so. And if nine months after somebody dies, that can go by very quickly. You know, maybe you have three, two kids, they get on top of it, they go to the financial advisor and they make their election, but one of them doesn't, that one will be set back. Yeah, and I'm reminded now, a good friend of mine from college um, called me a few years ago and he said, hey, Jim, my mom passed away and he, um, he, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's a responsible, really nice guy, lives in Arizona now. His mom had 17 IRAs. That's probably right there is, if you hate your kids, have 17 IRAs, okay? And here's what happened. He was the beneficiary on some of them. The sister was the beneficiary on others. And some of them, it was 50-50. It was a mess. And he calls me and he says, Jim, I'm calling you because my sister is mad at me and she won't talk to me. 
and she won't tell me where the IRAs are. So he knew that he had inherited IRAs, but he had to do stuff in order to be a designated beneficiary. And because his sister was mad at him, she refused to give him anything. He had to hire me essentially to sue her to, to produce the information. But, um, you know, uh, things happen, you know, you hear like this term, the fog of war. Well, there's like this fog of trust administration and the fog of postmortem administration. Um, things kind of go to hell in a handbasket really fast. And it is so important because there are so many penalties associated with IRAs and the penalty is 50%, half the value of the account if you don't do your stuff on time. Very, very important. 17 IRAs, even, even when things go right and the family is totally fine, they'll come into our office and they'll ask us, you know, where are the IRAs? And maybe we have a clue if they met with us recently, but if they didn't, the kids, they're going to have to wait for all the mail to come in before they can see where it is. I guess it's kind of like getting like little lotto ticket type things. You, you, get, the, you get the mail, you're going to open it to see how much money you're going to get, but it still takes a long time. So really, or do, do you have the question to read? Yeah. Uh, do, you handle, do you handle people living in Texas like me? Or if not, can you recommend someone in Texas? Well, my parents actually moved to Fort Worth about two years ago. And I'm an only child, so I have issues with that. But anyway, whatever. So they're living in Fort Worth. Just reach out to, actually reach out to Connor is probably the best way to do it. And we'll yeah, we have our connections. That's a big state. We, we try to come up with our, with our list of attorneys in different states. The bigger the state, the better the chance we have an attorney there. Yeah. Uh, and so really, if you have an IRA, and if your IRA is a large part of your assets or something you care about, we do complimentary appointments, either in person or via Zoom, to discuss if it makes sense for you. Uh, so what to do now, look at your estate plan, make sure you have the right trustees, beneficiaries in place. If you have an IRA trust, if you have retirement savings, contact your attorney, financial advisor, CPA, listen to your advisors. That's what Jim and I always try to stress. Yeah, it's a three, it's the old three legged stool. And I will tell you, um, I've been doing this 25 years and there are there are certain areas of the law and, and IRAs is one of them where the advisors think that they know all the rules, but they don't, okay? And it's very important for these three people to work together. If you don't have a financial advisor and you're trying to do a Roth conversion or you're trying to do this planning, you really do need a financial advisor. I mean, you need someone to sit down with a game plan. Um, and these three people need to be working so closely. They really should have each other's cell phone numbers because it's impossible to reach me uh, my friends and, and colleagues, I give them my cell phone number. So if I'm working with a financial advisor, I give that person my cell phone number so she can call me and, and we can actually have a quick, meaningful dialogue uh, rather than uh, you know, going through secretaries and assistants and that sort of thing. So are the rules same for people living overseas? Ooh, uh, that's a very loaded question. Um, I'm not sure, Alistair, if you're talking about the beneficiary or the owner of the IRA, but here's one thing. In order to be a designated beneficiary, you need a taxpayer identification number. Um, so what we've done for a lot of our clients, we have a lot of clients who are Japanese nationals or have family in Japan. Japan has very high inheritance taxes. Probably one of the last things you want to do is leave an IRA to a Japanese citizen without any plan. Uh, you would want to keep that money cited in the United States. Uh, before IRA money can leave the United States, you have to pay taxes on it. So you need a mechanism to um, administer that. So if you have, um, a lot of our clients are Mexican nationals. That's another, uh, a, another big pool of people. So these are people who uh, have, have built wealth in the United States and they want to leave wealth to somebody who's a citizen of Mexico. Well, if they don't have a social security number and their whole life's in Mexico, you need a, a mechanism, right, to set up the inherited IRA. And again, all these deadlines apply and, and the critical one is getting a taxpayer identification number. And so a trust is a very um, effective tool to name multiple beneficiaries. And then after the person dies, that's when you get the individual taxpayer identification numbers because there's a reason to get it. Um, it's a lot of work just to name someone on a beneficiary designation to get a taxpayer identification number. So um, Alistair, great questions. We can certainly help you uh, on that. If our IRA trust was created by you as dated January 2017, is there anything we need to change given the SECURE Act? Please explain more completely accumulation trust. Uh, Gregory, the answer is yes. We should take a look at it. Um, an accumulation trust is different from a conduit trust. A conduit trust is like electrical conduit. It's like looking through a straw. 
The money comes in, the money goes out. Minimum distributions leave the IRA account and they must exit the trust in that same tax year, okay? That's a conduit trust. An accumulation trust, the only difference is that the trustee has the power to withhold the distribution. That becomes very, very important when the minimum distribution is all of the money in the 10th year, right? That December 31, if someone dies in 2020, that December 31st of 2030. You may not want to distribute all that income, certainly to a California resident, because you're going to add 11%, 12 13% um, state income tax on top of that. If you can keep that in the trust, you're not going to pay that California state income tax. Now, the real answer is it's deferred until it's distributed to the California beneficiary. But uh, there are some cases going in the Supreme Court right now where we think that that, that may not be the, the case in the future. But many people choose not to, re to retire in California. So let's say someone inherits the IRA at age 50 and they know they're going to retire at age 65 and move to Nevada. A very common place that people move from. Uh, Texas is another one that has no state income tax. If you know that, okay, you're at 50 when you inherit the IRA, if you know you're going to leave California when you're 65, when you retire, and that minimum distribution comes out at age 60, it makes sense to defer the state income tax because when you actually take that money, when you turn 65, when you're living in another state, you will never pay California income tax. And that's saving over $100,000. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire or a centenaire or a billionaire. Everyone pays attention to $100,000. It's a lot of money. Okay, and then so really quick, to tag on just really quick for Gregory's question. So it's hard to answer if, if you've done an IRA trust in 17, if there's any changes, because really that conduit versus accumulation. Conduits make sense for eligible designated beneficiaries, but for designated beneficiaries, that's not necessarily the case. So we really have to review to make sure they do. So it is important to do a review to see for your particular situation if conduit versus accumulation makes sense. All right, go ahead, Jim. Uh, Alistair, what's the best thing to tell potential beneficiaries prior to one's demise? Um, I made the mistake. I, I had a client who's now deceased who um, had a, a, I don't know, he had like the largest collection of single shot British military pistols in the world or something. And, and he wanted to leave it to, um, to, the, to people. And, and he says, should I tell? I mean, the whole point of me telling you this is he said, should I tell anyone? about my estate plan. And I was young. I was like, sure, tell him. He came back. I mentioned, I, I see people years later. He came back years and years later. He was like, Jim, you remember I asked you if I should tell someone about my estate plan? I'm like, oh uh, yeah. And he said, that, that was terrible advice. So that being said, Alistair, that being said, this is the one caveat. You probably should tell them, all right? Or have a trustee on the IRA trust who knows these people. Who knows where they are? Because if you just leave a random name, you know, um, uh, and the example I gave was Dave Brown. And somebody wrote, I, I looked at an advanced healthcare directive years ago, and it says, I named Dave Brown of London, England, as my agent to make healthcare decisions. And I was like, how many Dave Browns are there in London? You know, there's probably a club of Dave Browns. It's a very common name. You need identifying information is the bottom line. You need to give your trustee the current information to reach these people. Um, and Carol asks, Wait, now after the- Alistair, yeah. Alistair was the one with the foreign beneficiaries. Yeah, with foreign beneficiaries. So especially if you have foreign beneficiaries, yeah. make sure your trustee knows how to reach them because that is a whole, a whole obstacle in itself. Carol asks, now after the Secure Act, are there differences between inheriting a traditional or a second generation inherited IRA? Great question. And I think I know the answer, but I think we talked about this, uh, Connor. I want to say everyone's under the 10-year rule. Mm -hmm. That was my understanding. Is that, is that your understanding? I have, or? Like, I have to look it up. We haven't. I, I don't think we've seen it too closely. Yet. I, I, I wouldn't. Carol, don't go to the bank on that one. But yeah. I believe, um, and this may be dependent on Treasury regulations coming out. But obviously... That's a great, a great point is who inherits the inherited IRA and under what terms. I believe everyone's under the 10 year. Well, uh, just keep in mind, six months ago, this law changed. We haven't yet had anyone die with an inherited IRA over those six months. And the regs have not been issued on the new Secure Act. So eventually we will know the answer, but not quite for now. 
And then Kathy asks, how big is the IRA that benefits from an IRA trust? How about 2.8 million? A $2.8 million IRA should absolutely be in an IRA inheritance trust. No question. No question. That's just too much money. You need a plan for that money. It's exposed to creditors. Who's going to actually inherit it? Very big, uh, uh, tremendous blessing, um, but uh, definitely consider an IRA trust. Uh, how do you set up an out-of-state IRA trust? We can help you with that. Most of our IRA trusts now are set up under Nevada law. Some of them are under California law, but Nevada has a lot of... Um, there are a lot of reasons why you would want to have the trust cited in Nevada for your IRA. Um, and then I think answered, uh, answered that question, Kathy's question, how do you set up an out-of-state IRA trust? You, you check in with us. By the way, the IRA trust, you create the IRA trust and you name as your beneficiary of your IRA, the IRA trust, okay? The IRA legacy trust. So unlike a revocable- You don't put your IRA in the trust. You don't put your IRA in the trust right now. It happens after you die. Revocable, revocable trust that you probably all have that's going to hold your house while you hold your bank accounts. IRA trust, it has $10 in cash in theory while you live. And then once you pass away, it inherits these different accounts. So it's almost an empty vessel until you pass away. And to Walter's point, you're in Texas. Uh, you can use Texas law for IRA trust. I would just say that you may want to consider Nevada. Uh, Nevada has a really fantastic, uh, very modern, uh, very uh, taxpayer-friendly statutes um, that, that are really unique to Nevada. And that's why we kind of choose that as the, uh, as the place where we cite the trusts. And we have a very reputable institutional trustee um, who can serve as trustee. That's, that's very important. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, well here's what I recommend you guys do. Uh, if you have an IRA and you're here and you're like, wow, I need a plan for my IRA, please reach out to us. Uh, you can, uh, is there a phone number on there? You know, I don't think so. Cunninghamlegal.com, you can make your consultation. You, go you can right also call, call 866-988-3956. And I'll write that in the notes uh, to... All panelists in it. The phone number domestically is 866-988-3956. For international, it is 530-269-1515. Uh, That's our the headquarters. So international would be uh, the 530 number. And you can uh, and, go to cunninghamlegal.com like I have up here. And you can mm -hmm. see book a phone consultation. You can see our upcoming virtual workshops in the future. So like the one we had today, which was how to pass IRA retirement plans. Uh, next week, we have our general estate plan meeting, of course, but we have Jeff Rosen and Jim doing Prop 13 is a risk, how not to- Oh gosh, Prop 13, guys. This is uh, Javier Becerra, our attorney general, just approved a ballot initiative. I think Prop 13's days are numbered. It's gonna be limited. It's going to start with commercial property. I think it will end with only protecting the home. That is my prediction because the state of California depends on two thirds of its revenue from personal income. How do you think that's going this year? Think about that. With the unemployment, it's going to be severely negatively impacted uh, with all the people who are currently unemployed. Uh, it's getting tough times for California. So I see them changing the property tax system to generate more revenue. Greg says, if all the retirement assets one has are in Roth accounts, is it still important to have a Roth, to have an IRA trust? It's probably more important with a Roth because here's the thing. You, in order to stretch your Roth out for 10 years, you still have to be a designated beneficiary. If you're not a designated beneficiary, you have to take the money out essentially 20% a year for five years. That destroys a tremendous value in deferring taxes and having tax-free growth and capital appreciation. So absolutely, yes. It's even better, frankly, it's even better for if you're Roth, uh, for an IRA trust, if it's Roth money going in versus a non-Roth. And Alistair says, can you remind us uh, who you inform as to the identity of the beneficiaries? This would be your executor, your successor trustee, uh, and it's important to have as much identifying information as possible. Now, if they're in Europe or, or the UK, super easy to identify people. Everyone has a street address. Everyone has some identifiable, um, you know, uh, social security number or an equivalent. 
you get into other countries. I ha handled the probate where the beneficiaries lived in Syria. Syria did not uh, sign the Geneva Convention of 1964, which was really important in this particular case because um, they don't even have addresses in Syria. And, you know, they're in the middle of a civil war, um, so it's even worse. But uh, I would say people in Europe, not a big deal. You get into other countries, um, it, it can be kind of, um, kind of case by case. But uh, you would give that information to your executor or your successor trustee. And Anita says, thank you. Um, let's see, I think we've answered those. Any other questions? All right. We did it in 55 minutes. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's me talking too much. But thank you guys for attending today. And uh, please tune in for our future uh, webinars. We've got some great topics coming up. And uh, have a great day. Bye.